Amen. Um, would you stand to your feet this morning? If you've got your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 6. I'm going to preach something this morning that is going to be the one thing that all unbelievers think preachers preach on every single Sunday. And things that you probably don't necessarily like to hear preached about. We're going to talk about money today. I just saw a husband look at his wife and say, Ethel, grab your pocketbook. We're getting out of here. He's coming for my wallet. No, um, I was at a church one time, Randy McGrew, that he was in our first service. He invited me to this church in another city. And um, this is probably terrible for me to say, but I'm just going to say it. The preacher gets the offering. He's on the stage, and the guy was acting like, and he actually resembled Boss Hogg, if you know who that is. And he's on the stage counting money in front of everybody, just looking out at us like, if this ain't enough, we're fixing to do this thing again. And uh, anyway, it was just a funny moment. Sorry, maybe you had to be there, but I was scared to death. <laughs> then I went to a Catholic church just to visit one of their services with a friend of mine, and they took up a second offering. And I'm like, did y'all not get enough that first one? Y'all are doing this again? And he's like, no, this one was for the building fund. I'm like, man, y'all got a good deal here. We need to try this sometime. So I'm just kidding. I know money is not something, and if you're a visitor today for the first time, come back again, because we actually rarely talk about money here at Landmark Church. It's not something I preach about very often because unbelievers say all the time, all the preachers want is our money, all the church wants is our money. But I want you to know today, I believe God has called us to give him everything. And our money is part of that. So we're going to talk about grateful generosity today. Galatians chapter 6, beginning with verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Leave your Bible out. We're going to read a lot of scripture this morning. Father, we just thank you for your word. As we gather, gather around the table of the Lord, that Father, we realize you are the bread of life, that your word sustains us. That, Father, you're the one who gives us rest today. That you're the good shepherd that leads us by still waters. And you give us rest for our soul. So, Father, today, in the midst of everything going on around us and in our life, may we listen to you today, to what it means to be generous people. And, Father, I believe it's just another area of our life you're working on. Thank you for working in us and through us. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Ghost. And all God's people together said... Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, he doesn't want your money and you may be seated. <laughs> Have you ever felt like your wallet or your purse or your pocket had a hole in it? Put money in there and it just disappeared. You work, and you don't know where the money goes. The Bible in the book of Haggai, I'm going to read this in a moment, actually speaks specifically to this. In the book of Haggai, it talks about God says, you know what, you people live in nice houses, but my house is in ruins. You people have all this nice stuff, but you've left nothing to me. So he said, I want you to consider what's going on. And he says this in Haggai, and this describes what I just said to you a moment ago. Haggai 1 verse 5. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says, give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you are not worn. You weren't warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And I think the truth is, if we're honest, that's how a lot of us feel. I work, 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 but then nothing comes of it. I do all this stuff, and nothing comes of it. I try all these things, and nothing comes of it. But here's the problem. I think most of us, if we're honest today, we would say, you know what, Pastor? I don't have enough money. I don't have enough. I don't have enough stuff. If I had just a little bit more stuff, I'd be good. If I had a little bit more money, I'd be good. 
You realize they, 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 they polled people that made $35,000 and said, what do you need? They said, if I just had $40,000, i would be good. They polled people that had $40,000. If I just had $50,000, I'd be good. They asked people that had $50,000. If I had $70,000 and it kept going up, everybody needed a little bit more. To the point that even Norman Rockefeller, the wealthiest man at one time in the world, had more money in the world than anybody else. They asked him, how much money is enough? And he said, just a little bit more. Because the truth is, some of us feel like, I don't have enough. But let me let you in on a secret today. You're right, you don't have enough. You have more than enough. If you came in here today and you were able to drive or had a ride, you have more than enough. If you have a hot meal to eat, you have more than enough. If you have warm clothes on your body today, you have more than enough. Because the truth is this, it's really all compared to exactly where we live at. We look at everybody else, and we talked about comparing last week. We look at everybody else and said, if I had what they had, I would be good. But the truth is this, if we learn that we have more than enough, that we live in a place, we live in a country, we live in a place where there's freedom, we have a place where we have food, we have clothing, we have shelter, and when we come to that understanding... We don't live in a place where we say, I need more. We live in a place where we say, God, I'm grateful for what you have given me. I have more than enough. Amen? I think we have to get to the place to realize God blessed us so that we can be generous. God didn't bless you so that you could have everything. He blessed you so that you could be generous. My mother's favorite verse was 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11 in the NIV. It says it this way, You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. I love that. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be a blessing, be generous on every occasion. It's not generosity. It's not just about money. This is the problem. It's not just about my pocketbook. Generosity is really about one thing. Am I willing to bless others with what God has given me? It's really tied to two things. Number one, it's tied to your heart. Where is your heart? And the reason we tie money to that is because Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's about your heart and it's about obedience. Are you willing to be obedient with what God has given you? Do you think it's yours and only yours or are you willing to be obedient? And I believe God blesses us in many ways so we can be generous on every single occasion. Not just monetarily but so I can give my time. I can give my gifts. I can give time, talents. I can give what God has given me to somebody else and I can learn to live a generous life in every area of my life. Amen? We are called to give. They did a study and they found this out. The less people have, the more they give. And the more people have, the less they give. Jesus was walking one day with his disciples and they stand and they're watching the Pharisees take up the offering. They were doing the door offering long before we ever decided to do that. Sorry, my jokes are bombing today terribly. It's supposed to be a joke, sorry. So they're taking up an offering, and people are giving money, and they're showing people their money, and they're throwing in the offering. And one lady walks up, and she throws in a penny. And Jesus said, she gave more than the rest of them. And I can see the disciples looking at him like, Jesus, I know you're from Nazareth, but man, you must not know math very well. Because those dudes gave tons of money, and she just gave a penny. And Jesus said, you misunderstand. They gave because they had to out of a certain amount. She gave out of everything that she had. She gave out of the abundance of her heart toward that. And generosity is not about an amount. Generosity is about your heart and obedience. It's not about a certain amount. It's about are you willing to be obedient with what you've been given? Because different people have been given different things. And I believe this. I believe we will be judged by what we've been given, not by just what we give. We will be judged on what we've been given. So whenever, we'll talk about this even next week. I shouldn't tell you I'm going to talk about money two weeks in a row because next week the attendance is going to plummet like crazy. <laughs> and people will be like, when you talk about, stop talking about giving, I'll come back to church. But listen, here's the thing. When you understand that God has called you to be generous in every area of your life, you begin to realize that all of a sudden my obedience is tied to this. And it's not about what's in my bank account. It's about what I'm willing to give to the Lord. Amen? Here's the thing about our society. Our society is about hoarding. The more you have, the better off you are. But the kingdom of God is the opposite of that. 
Jesus said it this way, don't keep everything you've got. Give, and it will be given back to you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over will men give unto your bosom. Now listen, I'm just a redneck from Mississippi, and so I have weird illustrations, but I think about the times that my wife says the trash needs to be taken out. And I've used this before, and I know you husbands have gone home and used what I taught you to do. You go home, what do you do? The trash needs to be taken out, you press it down a little bit more. Okay? It's got about that much more room before we take that joker out, okay? You press that thing down. And then, the next time, you shake it a little bit, okay? And it settles. And then the third time, when it's full, you know it is good and full. God says, give, and it will be given back to you. Press down, shaken together, and running over will men give back to you. God says, when you give to me, I'm going to give so much. You can press it down, you can shake it together, and it's still going to be running over in your life because my shovel is bigger than your shovel. And when you learn to understand that when we give, once again, it's not just money, but when we give of our time, we give toward others, we give our love, we give all those things. God says when you begin to do that I will give back to you and it will come back to you in ways that you can't even imagine amen now let's get to the one thing nobody wants to talk about when we talk about money and the biggest argument probably is in this one word tithing okay I know what some people say tithing is an Old Testament principle and we're in the New Testament and we shouldn't do it let me just quickly very quickly just kind of lay out an argument for you on tithing I do believe that tithing was an Old Testament law. I can prove it even through Scripture. Leviticus 27.30 says this, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. So in the Old Testament, it was you bring a tithe, a tenth of everything that comes in, you bring it to the Lord. You give that tithe, that tenth, Back to the Lord. So we say, what about the New Testament? Well, listen to me. The New Testament, you say we're under grace, not under law. You're right. But here's the thing. Grace, and I'll explain what I mean by this, but grace is more difficult or harsher than law. Here's what I mean by this. In the Old Testament, you could look at a person, man or woman, and you could, so guys, you could look at a woman, ladies, you could look at a man, and you could lust after them, think every thought you want to think, but as long as you physically did not commit adultery, you were good. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I tell you, if you look at a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Because grace is more difficult than law. Under the law, I could think every bad thought about you. I could hate you. But as long as I didn't kill you, I didn't murder. But Jesus said, you've heard it said, thou shalt not murder. But if you look at somebody with hatred and you, already, and you look at them like you want them dead, you've already murdered them in your heart. Why? Because grace is harsher than law. Law says as long as you don't do it, you're okay. But grace says, no, it's not just about the act. It's about your attitude. It's about what you think about it. It's not just about what you do. It's about how you do it. And so when I understand that, here's why that matters. Because yes, you say the tithing is in the New Testament. Here's the thing. In the Old Testament, God said, here's 10%. To me, and 90% is yours. You can do whatever you want with it. You know what God says in the New Testament? 100% is mine. I want all of it. I want 100%. I want everything you've got. It's all mine. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. You are not even your own person. It is all mine. So what do we do? We believe in giving back to the Lord. We tithe back to Him to say, God, I recognize that this tenth is yours. But you know what? And I'll say more about this next week. God cares what you do with the 90% as much as He does with the 10%. But you say, I am going to give back to Him. That tithing is important because in doing this, what you're saying is, God, I recognize that I'm giving it to you. Now, here's how tithing works. Let me say this. I know I'm kind of teaching this morning, but stick with me through this. And this might sound weird to a lot of people, and you might have never heard this, and other preachers don't tell you this, but I'm going to say this to you today. Some of you say, you know what? I budget very well, and 10% isn't budgeted in my life right now. I want to tell you this. Here's what God is looking for. He's not just looking for an amount. He's looking for your heart. And the reason I say that is you start wherever you can start. It may be a smaller amount at first, but you say, God, I'm going to give what I can give, but from this, I'm going to work until I can give 10%. And here's what, here's, way, here's what matters, though, this part. It's not just about giving God the leftovers, okay? A lot of times it's, Lord, I'm going to pay all my bills, and whatever's left over, I'll give you that amount. 
I'm going to do all this stuff. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to go out to eat. I'm going to do all this entertainment. Whatever's left over, I will give that to you. That's not called tithing. That's more called tipping or just an offering, okay? If you want to tithe, here's what the Bible says about this in Exodus 23, 19. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. I believe that tithing is about the first fruits. Whenever the Bible says that Cain and Abel brought an offering to the Lord, Cain's offering was rejected and Abel's offering was accepted because Abel brought the first fruits. He brought the first fruits of what came in. Cain waited and he brought God the leftovers and God said, I'm not blessing this, but I'm blessing seen Abel's because Abel brought me the first. I believe that we're called to bring God the first fruit. So when I get paid, we still have checks here. We still use, uh, I, so I use mobile at pay. So I go there and I, I, I get my check and I pay that. We're part of a denomination. My tithes goes to them. So you know what the first thing I do? I get on my computer, I get on my phone and I pay my tithes from the very beginning because I want to trust God. I want to say, God, if faith is not me pay everything else and I'll give you what's less. Faith is, God, I'm going to give you what's yours and then you're going to help me with what I have left to be faithful to this and you're going to supply the needs in this moment. I am going to be faithful to this. I'm going to give you my first fruits and as I give God the first fruits, as I give God back what is his, I am saying God I trust you that you can help me make the 90% go where it needs to go. Amen? I know you weren't going to run aisles today but that's okay. I knew that. I knew that. Here's the thing I want you to see. Here's what Romans eleven sixteen 16 says. For if the first fruit is holy... The lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. So as I give God the first fruits, God blesses the 90%. When I give God what is His, God blesses the rest. And I believe He makes it where the rest will make, help go where it needs to go and help me be able to pay the bills and do what I need to do. Listen, in my own life, I want you to know that God has been faithful and, and God has proved himself time and time again. I don't have tons of stories of financial miracles. I would love to you know, have those kind of things, but God has always been faithful. He's always come through. If you know anything, my wife was in the first service. The, the church pays us very well, so this is not anything about my salary. We live on one salary. We live in a parsonage, so we're able to do that because... With child care, the cost of child care, it's easier for my wife to stay home and raise our boys. So we live on one salary. And you look at my, and here's the thing, we judge people that we look at them and say, you, you, you're spending a lot of money, you're wealthy, that's why you're saying this. And these shoes I got on, they're brand new. You paid for these. <laughs> you gave me a gift card last week, so I bought these. So thank you, you paid for these. <laughs> I've lost some weight, I needed new pants. These, I got new pants yesterday. You know what? These pants cost $20. That's all, I, 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 I'm not out buying brand new stuff all the time. But you know what God has helped me and my wife to be able to do? Mainly her. I give her credit to me. She's the money person. I'm not. Whenever we were married, we had debt. But God helped us over time to pay off that debt. So now we're debt free because of that. It, but here's what it meant. It meant that we were going to give God the tithe. And then we were going to, on the 90%, we were going to not be able to do everything. Yes, I go on vacations and you see that. You know what? I, we, we save year long and we pay for that up front. So we're not in debt because of that. God has blessed us to be able to do that. But it takes sacrifice. It means we can't do what everybody else is doing all the time. We can't afford what everybody else is affording. But we are faithful faithful over the 90% so that we can live debt free and do what God has called us to do. And when you will begin to release that 10% to God, I believe God will give you the wisdom to how to use the 90% to be able to be generous to other people. We want to be debt free because we want to be a place where we can be generous to others and we can bless other people's life. And it only happened because we were willing to give God the 10 and then say, God, give us wisdom over the 90. Amen. I'll, I'll amen myself. Amen. Number two. Not only are we called to give, but we're called to give cheerfully. Cheerfully. Here's what Corinthians says, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. In other words, when you give, you shouldn't look like the greeter at Walmart, okay? You should smile when you're giving. When you give, you should have a little smile about your life. Sorry, some of y'all might be greeters at Walmart. I was just kidding. <laughs> smile. Be cheerful. I love when I've gone overseas, and man, especially when I've gone to Africa, and I love to watch the way they give. I mean, they start playing music. They're coming up and down the aisle. I thought one time, I got in line, I thought we were doing the cha-cha-cha for a minute. Like, I'm up there. Like, wrong party. My bad. Sorry. I'm up there doing this. 
There's a video on social media somewhere. You can find this. I love it. This dude, he like literally is dancing all the way up the aisle. He does a flip. And, I mean, he dances, spins in circles, does a flip, lands, stands up, and drops the money in the offering bucket. If some of y'all want to do that later, we will clear the aisle and let you do that. But I love that because what the guy is saying is, is I get to do this. Listen to me. You don't give because you have to. You give because you get to. You give because you can. That I, I, I get to bless others, not because I have to. I get to. I get to be a blessing. I get to make a difference. I don't have to do these things. And when our mindset begins to change, that God, everything is yours. God, you own it all. It is all yours. So God, what do you want me to do with this? And once again, I don't want to get into my sermon next week, but some of you are already asleep and you'll forget it by next week, so I'll say this already. But when you begin to think about, listen, it's always easier for me to spend other people's money than it is my own. You understand that? Like it's easier when the church says, hey, go buy something. I'm like, oh, let's go buy this. <laughs> Board approved it, let's go. Because it's not my money. Well, you know what? This ain't your money. None of it. And when you begin to have that mentality, Lord, it's yours. What do you want me to do with it? God, it's all yours. What do you want me to do? I'm going to pay my bills because you want me to do that. But how can I bless others? How can I make a difference? God, I know you want me to have these shoes, so I'm going to go buy those. I'm just kidding. Sorry. I'm just kidding. Sorry. Had, had to go there. But here's the thing. When I begin to change my mentality, when I begin to think it's not about that I have to do these things, but I get to do these things, and I'm going to give, but I'm going to give cheerfully. I'm going to give out of abundance in my heart because God has blessed me. It makes a huge difference. Amen? And then number three, we are called to plant the seed. And allow God to grow the harvest. Here's what, the, here's what God said. Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. When God put vegetation on the earth, he only had to create it one time. When God created mankind, man and woman, Adam and Eve, he only had to create mankind one time. He put inside of them what they needed to reproduce. In an apple is not just what you can eat. Inside of that apple is what that apple needs to reproduce. And when I understand that, that my, my money is not just something that I'm giving, it is a seed that I'm sowing, I believe it begins to make a difference. That I begin to say, okay, Lord, and hey, listen, this is a weird principle, but every time in my life I've needed a financial miracle, God has told me, I want you to go sow a seed in somebody's life. I want you to go bless somebody else and sow a seed. And the times that I've done that, God has come through time and time and time again because I believe I was willing to release that and say, here's a seed I am planting, and because of that, a harvest is going to happen. Jesus, I mean, Paul said it this way, that you, if you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap to the flesh. But when you sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap to the Spirit. And once again, it's not just about money. If you need help doing something, if you need your yard mowed, go mow somebody else's yard. Go over there and use their lawnmower, believing that God's going to help you take care of yours. If you need something in your life, you need help with something, go sow into somebody else's life. Go make a difference. And as you begin to live a generous life, God will bring Bring it back on you. I believe the blessings of God, the Bible says, overtake us. I don't have to look for the blessings of God. I'm not running around trying to get blessed. I am simply living the life God is calling me to live. I'm being faithful. I am planting the seeds. And because of that, the blessings of God are going to overtake my life because it is God who comes through time and time and time again. And He does it whenever I need it in my life. He comes through and He makes a difference. And when I begin to shift my mentality of now I am blessed to be a blessing. I am blessed to be generous. Now my life has changed. All of a sudden, it begins to change the way I react to things. Will the worship team join me? I'm almost done. Listen, some of you, God has brought you through some horrible situations and he's given you a revelation about how to make it through difficult times. And God is telling you, this is not for you to keep to yourself. It's for you to sow into somebody else's life. For some of you, it is financial. God has given you a gift, and he's given you the ability to have resources. And he's saying, I gave you that for a reason. But what I want you to see is this. Whatever area it is, whether it's financial, whether it's a revelation, a time, some of you are gifted in ways you can make a difference. And God's saying this, if you will be generous with that, what I've given you, then I will begin to work in your life in ways you can't even imagine. 
And when we begin to think about that, the, the greatest principle of generosity is in the Bible. It's probably the verse that you learned right around the time maybe you learned Psalms 23, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. For God so loved the world that he gave. And he didn't give the leftovers. He didn't give whatever he just thought we barely needed. He gave his only begotten son. I love you today. I love you dearly. But my two boys that were here this morning in the first service, you ain't going to have their life for yours. I'm sorry. I love you. But Jesus gave his son the very best he had so that you could have everlasting life. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He gave his best. And I believe we're called to live generous. Why does this matter? Listen, once again, I know I'm, I'm a Pentecostal preacher. I like shouting, and I like for you to get excited, and I like leaving here being victorious. But here's the problem. We can have all that hype sometimes, and we can leave here feeling that way. But you know what? We still struggle outside these doors because we haven't been taught what it means to give God every area of our life. And what I want you to see today is this. I'm not a prosperity preacher that's promising you if you give money today in the offering, God's going to just load your pocketbooks down with tons of money. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that if you do all that. What I am saying to you is this. Time and time again, every time that I've been faithful to the Lord, Here's the thing, even when I haven't been faithful, he has always been faithful. He's always come through. But you know what? Whenever, whenever I've been willing to say, Lord, here's this, I give it to you. He has, he has come through in ways I can't imagine. I've, I've told this story several times. I'm not that old. So I tell you, I have to tell the same stories over and over and over because my personal ones, I don't have that many. But in Bible college, I was just kind of struggling. My parents, my dad is a pastor and they would try to help me when they could, but we just didn't have a lot of money to, to send me a lot of resources. And so I had to eat in the cafeteria, and this is back before um, the cafeteria at the school had options. It was like whatever one thing they serve, that's what you're going to eat. And You know, I just want to be able to do some things, and I, I couldn't ever give offerings or anything. And I remember telling the Lord one time, Lord, I want to be able to give. I want to be able to go enjoy life. I just don't have any money. So I said, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this. Lord, if you will give me money, if people send me money, I will give away half of everything that I give. And I, I promise you, I'm not saying this to make up a good story to end the sermon with. All of a sudden, checks started coming in the mail. Not much, $20. I would immediately take $10 and go bless somebody else in the college. And, and for a period of time, it didn't last forever, but there was a season of my life where I, I believe the Lord was just trying to show me he would be faithful. In that season of my life, money would come in the mail and I would give half of it away. Time and time and time again. Because God was showing me. Listen, if you're willing to let go, I want to say this to you today. This might sound weird coming from a preacher. But I want you to, I, I tell you this is try it. Try it. God says that. Malachi. Will a man rob God? But you rob me. Well, Lord, I haven't seen you to stick up and say, give me your money. What do you mean I've robbed you? In my tithe and your offering. But he says, if you'll do this, if you'll be faithful and trust me, will I not open the windows of heaven and pour a blessing on you that you can't handle? That's one of the few places where God says, try it. Test me now, says the Lord. Try it out. And I encourage you, listen, try it. Begin to let God work in your life. Begin to have a generous heart. If you say, I don't have any money, I don't have any income right now, that's okay. Just start with generosity of your heart. What do you have that you can bless others with? Maybe it's an encouraging word. I'm going to walk around and I'm going to tithe today because I'm going to say, I'm going to make sure part of everything I do is blessing somebody else. Part of everything I say is going to be speaking blessings over somebody's life. Begin to think, what is it that I've got that I can be generous with? And when you begin to shift your mentality, listen to me, it's not just about trying to get more money for the church. I want you to know this, but when you begin to give, you begin to participate in the life of God. There are people right now, I wish I had time to tell you story after story after story. I'm getting every single week of what God is doing in these services. People that are coming in saying, I've never felt the presence of God in my life, but I, know, I, I showed up and God met me in a way. Do you realize because you're here and because you're generous, we've got lights on today, which means we can hope.
host the presence of God in this place because you are, you are part of that. You are participating in what God is doing because of your generosity. And when you begin to shift your thinking, so you know what, it's not about me. It's about how can I learn to be generous. I believe God is going to bring breakthroughs in your life in ways you can't imagine. Once again, God's not trying to get your money from you. He's trying to get your heart. Are you willing to be obedient to whatever he has given you? Will you stand to your feet?